Welcome to Human Monsters, Part 1, Robert Lee Yates. Robert Lee Yates was born on the May 27th, 1952 in Oak Harbor, Washington. He was born into a family with a history of violence. Example, in 1945, his grandmother took up an axe and slayed his grandfather. His father witnessed the aftermath while his mother sat quietly in her room, relaxing. Somehow such a grisly scene could transpire in this house without a marked disruption in their daily routine. His grandmother snapped after having 11 children with little help from her husband, who was often away working. She spent the subsequent seven years in a psychiatric hospital. The Robert Lee Yates of this story, named after his father, but known by most as Bobby, was remembered as a quiet child. He was polite, minded his manners, and stayed out of trouble. He was raised in a safe and quiet community, which no doubt contributed to his deferential and people-pleasing tendencies. His father also brought him to the Seventh-day Adventist church. He attended after he inculcated into Bobby the values and beliefs of the Adventists. Father and son had a strong bond and did nearly everything together. They also shared every aspect of their lives together. Well, there was one secret Bobby could not bring himself to share with his father. When Bobby was six years old, he was molested by a neighbor who was five years his senior. He didn't tell anyone about it. After graduating high school, Bobby attended classes at Skagit Valley College, where he graduated in 1972 with a degree in general studies. He didn't bother to attend graduate school. Bobby Yates did not jump on the generational bandwagon with his male contemporaries. He didn't grow his hair long. He didn't do drugs. He continued with the hobbies he picked up during his youth, like hunting, fishing, shooting, and hiking. Indeed, he was an outdoorsman. Bobby Yates was married once to a woman named Shirley Nylander. He was 20 years old. They fell in love quickly, married in haste, and were just as quickly living together. They soon moved to College Place in Walla Walla, where they could pursue their studies together. Part of the appeal for Bobby was that it was run by the Seventh-day Adventists. The marriage was not to last 18 months in, and they separated on acrimonious terms. By that point, he had already met a woman that appealed to him, Linda Brewer. Apparently, she was really something else, for she enabled him to get over Shirley in short order. Maybe she had big tits. I don't know. Bobby and Linda had a child together in 1974. Realizing he was responsible for another life, he took a job at Washington State Penitentiary, as a corrections officer. This would enable him to stay in Walla Walla, as he'd hoped he would. Six months later, he resigned with no explanation other than working in that position was not for him. Rejecting such plebeian occupations, Bobby decided to pursue his lifelong aspiration to become an aviator joining the armed forces and serving with the Air Force. He passed all the tests and was accepted. During his time home, 
Linda began to observe some strange behaviors in Bobby. A month after their wedding, she discovered he had drilled a hole in the wall. The hole outfitted him with a view of the neighbor's bedroom. Linda was weirded out and disgusted. She immediately left him. This became a pattern. She would learn about his aberrant sexual proclivities, throw up in her mouth a little, leave him, but eventually return. Part of the reason she would return was that his income provided security for their family. Her children also wanted the security of having both parents around. Bobby was a highly skilled helicopter pilot, so much so he received several medals during his years of service. When Linda attended military social functions with him, people reacted like they were surprised he was married. 1995. Bobby was now stationed in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Eighteen months away from qualifying for a military pension and retirement, Bobby tendered his resignation. No explanation was given. Those close to him, personally and professionally, were either baffled or annoyed. Either way, nobody could make sense of it. Bobby announced to his family that they were moving to Spokane, Washington. Whether or not it came across to them as incredibly random, it was fucking happening. End of story. One possible reason Bobby decided to resign from the military was that the type of helicopter he specialized in had become obsolete, or at least the military perceived it as such. Bobby must have considered that he, too, would have fallen into obsolescence in their eyes. The government was making cuts to the military and offered financial incentives to staff who left voluntarily. He had served for 21 years, so conjecture had it, among many, that he was simply bored with the whole thing. By the time they moved to Spokane, the love between Bobby and Linda had dwindled down to nothing. She decided to stay with him for the sake of the children. There weren't any opportunities for a helicopter pilot in this town, so he accepted a position working as a factory worker in a factory that manufactured parts for machines. Eventually, he was laid off and went to work at an aluminum processing plant. Nobody among his colleagues would have remembered the paternal figure as anything but reliable and friendly. He was never perceived by any of them as serial killer material. People wonder what the telltale signs of such a person are, but it's not like he's going to read the obituary column in the newspaper with a piercing erection. They don't usually send out those creepy vibes we associate with that type of offender. Bobby came to miss military life, so in 1997 he applied to and was accepted by the National Guard, with which he served three years. Due to a medical issue, he was suspended from flying helicopters. The periods during which he was strictly earthbound was spring of 1998 to spring of 1999. As it turned out, the residents of Spokane were safer with him in the sky. Bobby Yates began to train his crosshairs on people whose lives he was more than happy to extinguish. He targeted people he felt were characterized by conventional society as human garbage, people like the homeless and, especially in Yates's purview, prostitutes. 
he would wind himself up with narcotics before he embarked on an onslaught of mayhem. August 26, 1997. Military veteran Larry Jones was out for a walk and decided to collect soft drink cans along the way for some pocket money. At 11 o'clock a.m., he was heading down East Springfield Street when he spotted a corpse half concealed beneath a tree. The body was that of a young woman. She was half naked. It was clear she had been left there for a long time because her skin was weathered after prolonged exposure to the elements. While detectives were examining the area, they found a gallon of blood splattered across a parking lot nearby. They quickly surmised that the body was dragged across the lot, over an embankment, and finally to the tree. It was time to break out the vapo rub. The body was in an advanced stage of decomposition. It was so foul, this odor, you didn't have to be a rookie to puke up your coffee and donuts. A second body was found. This was discovered by the side of the road nearby. It had been dragged out into the middle of a field. The stench made it impossible to determine the approximate date of death. This corpse was discovered by the family upon whose farm the body found its final resting place. The body was of a young woman, and it was teeming with maggots. Her skin was leathery from rot. The decomposition was so advanced, the coroner could not even determine the girl's racial ancestry. Some clues found near the corpse included... A condom, a pair of high heels, a broken car radio antenna, a pair of black underpants, a towel that had been drenched in blood, and blood stains on some of the flora. Her hair color was impossible to discern because it was matted with dirt and blood. Chunks of her flesh had been removed. Animal predation was proposed as a cause, but was not proven. A small circular perforation suggested a bullet wound. The autopsy concluded that she died from gunshot wounds in the chest and shoulder. She was shot with a twenty two caliber pistol. The girl found by the parking lot died from a shot fired from a 25 caliber gun. She was shot in the head. She hadn't decomposed as much as the other girl, so the police were able to get a fingerprint. After entering the print into the computer, an officer got a match. Heather Hernandez, a 20-year-old drifter from Arizona. Because of her nomadic lifestyle, few people knew much about her. The closest the police got to ascertaining the identity of the other girl was when they were given the name Jennifer Kim. The name was an alias, but what was known was that she was 19 years old and had been acquainted with Heather Hernandez. After probing into the matter of the name further, police discovered that Jennifer Kim's real name was Jennifer Joseph. According to her parents, her stated age was also incorrect. She was 16. She was the daughter of a military officer and spent her youth traveling all over America. Her mother was in Hawaii at the time of her death. Jennifer was in Spokane with her boyfriend. He left weeks before she died. Police wanted to get in touch with him to see if he might be a suspect. Bobby Yates had taken to spending his leisure time in a section of Spokane known by locals as Skid Row. 
It was the place where sex workers, drug dealers, and other people who operated at the fringes of society would congregate to socialize or do business. His Ford 1979 van, I don't know what model it is, and I don't give a fuck. I'm not a car guy. But that van became a fixture of Skid Row. When Bobby Yates wasn't banging prostitutes, he was hanging out with them, learning their names or pseudonyms, who had crotch rot, all that shit. He was an enthusiastic drug user, so spending time in those parts meant he benefited from that standpoint. He had boinked so many hookers that they knew him by name, which was an alias. They even trusted him, or at least they trusted him as much as they could trust a trick. He always paid. He didn't beat them up. No scat, no animals. He would even incorporate some drinks or drugs into the occasion. That made sense, since many sex workers are addicts. Many prostitutes have regular johns, and servicing them is always preferable to some random creep from the street. Finding associates of Jennifer Johnson among the sex workers who would be willing to cooperate in the investigation was not easy. She was well-liked among that contingent, she was part Korean, and apparently the clientele serviced in that area of the city were struck with yellow fever. The sex workers identified their johns by the vehicles they drove. Throughout the investigation, there were many leads that led to nowhere. However, one day, Detective Rick Grabenstein received a phone call from a sex worker who was a familiar face on Skid Row, but retained anonymity over the phone. She recalled a 1970s van to the officer, what would have by then be referred to as, by comedians, a 70s date rape van. Whether any rapes took place in the van was unknown at that time. Whether the paint job was an illustration of a wizard, like from the back of Led Zeppelin IV, that was so common among van owners in the 70s, also remains unknown. Actually, the outer decor of the van wasn't nearly so interesting. It was a dark, shit-brown Chevy with a light beige panel highlight with brown flames as... If Bobby Yates shat on it himself, on the back of the van, where one customarily kept the spare tire, was an eagle, bird of prey. Interesting. The girl said the driver was white, likely middle-aged, and his hair was also brown. Difficult to discern exactly which shade from among the gradient of feces. But this man was surrounded by brown in her recollection. The 70s was the golden age of brown, so seeing it on the outdated van in question came as no surprise. When the girl agreed to talk to the detective, he was required to honor the condition that he not contact her parents to tell them she was a prostitute, or at least not unless they had a defibrillator nearby. He asked her why that van was particularly memorable. One thing she pointed out was that the second time she saw it, the windows were tinted. Tinted windows were perceived as a red flag among the sex workers of Skid Row. Other prostitutes who had dealings with the driver said he was harmless, but the woman being interviewed by Grabenstein wasn't buying it. She saw Heather get into the van a few days before her body was found. Linda recalled one suspicious incident involving Bobby. 
One night, he went out late and didn't return until after 6 a.m. Linda locked the doors, so he had to knock to be permitted inside. He gathered up all their cleaning supplies and made a beeline for the van. Linda followed him out there. There were huge splotches of blood all over the interior of the van. The pull-down cot looked like it had been dipped in blood. He told Linda he ran over a dog and that he and the dog's owner brought the animal's remains in the van. The furthest thing from Linda's mind was that he was soaking up the remains of a dead hooker, so she accepted this story. More women disappeared. Some of the names were Darla Scott, Sean Johnson, and Lori Wason. They weren't all sex workers, but they were heavily immersed in the local drug scene. November 5th, a man was walking his dog near Hangman Valley Road. His dog was attracted to one spot for days. On this day, his owner decided to investigate the spot. He found a dead woman. He called his finding into the police. The murderer made a half ass attempt to bury the body. The head, an arm, and a leg were visible, but the rest of her was buried. It had been decomposing, and animals took bites out of the body. The entire right side of the head had been stripped of its flesh, leaving a bare skull with a strip of errant hair flapping in the wind. The animals left teeth marks in her flesh. There was a round hole in the back of her head, suggesting she had been shot. The animals tore muscle and sinew from the woman's shoulder. The same damage was spotted on the right foot and ankle. She was wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, which was torn and bloodied. Exact estimates of the woman's age eluded the coroner as he performed the autopsy. Conjecture had it that she was between 20 and 30 years old. It wasn't so difficult to ascertain the cause of death, she had been shot in the head twice. He couldn't even get the size of the bullets right since they passed straight through the head and were not found at the scene. Swabs of the victim's vagina, anus, and mouth were taken to find traces of foreign DNA. On November 12th, dental records revealed that the victim was Darla Scott, after interviewing her family and friends, it was discovered that she was a drug addict who had once quit because she became pregnant and did not want to harm the baby. Though she hoped the baby would keep her off the streets, she ultimately fell back into addiction after the child was born and turned to prostitution to finance her habit. Sometimes she would travel from state to state with truckers providing sexual services in exchange for drugs and transportation. December 7th, the body of Melinda Mercer was found. This body was found in the city of Tacoma, Washington, which is a long distance from Spokane. No matter where you went to in Washington state at that time, the local climate despite being heavy in precipitation, still left the streets running with the blood of young women. Melinda was naked when her body was discovered. It appeared that no effort was made to conceal her remains. A casing from a twenty-five caliber bullet was found. None of her belongings remained in the vicinity of her body. Police surmised that a car had brought her to the spot where she was dumped. Melinda was a waitress who was fondly remembered by all who knew her. She was a kind woman, but she aligned herself 
with the seedy underbelly of Tacoma and other cities in Washington State, enough to turn tricks when she was hard up for cash. She was a drifter, moving frequently within the state. Belinda's cause of death was multiple gunshots to the head. December 18th. The body of Sean Johnson was found by a crew of maintenance workers. This was another corpse that was found on Hangman Valley Road. Without foreseeing it, the municipal officials who named that street made a sick joke. No attempt was made to bury this body. She was just dumped. Some natural detritus, like leaves and other discarded flora, were thrown atop her. But they were more effective as decoration than as concealment. The offender was as unconcerned about getting caught as he was about the life of this victim and all the lives her death would affect. The post-mortem analysis would present more data to the coroner since the cold weather brought the decomposition process to a standstill. Identification would take time, though, since her belongings were not found close by. Two plastic bags were placed over her head. Vaginal, anal, and oral swabs were taken to detect the presence of foreign DNA. Soon, Sean Johnson's identity was confirmed. She had been a sex worker in Skid Row. Her diary was found. All she wanted out of life was to become a wife, mother, and homeowner. Drugs and prostitution planted a barricade around all that. A county-wide task force was assembled to track down what law enforcement now knew was a serial killer. December 26th, two more bodies turned up, Lori Wason and Sean McClanahan. They were found in Spokane. They had been on a missing persons list before they were found. There was a possibility with these women that it might not have been a serial killer who was responsible. Both women had cooperated with police and were known as snitches. There were likely many people who wanted them to disappear. They had also stolen from people, and again, that's not exactly a surefire way to ingratiate yourself to other people on the street. They were placed side by side in a gully within the wooded area of Spokane. They were discovered by a local attorney and his son as they were out for a walk. One of the women was missing a foot. They were both covered in natural detritus and snow. Oddly, the leaves and branches were not indigenous to the area. Did the murderer go on scavenger hunts in other forests to find material to conceal his corpses? Apparently so. Detectives consulted data regarding the types of flora that was found within different areas of Washington State to find out where the samples were harvested. As with most of the other victims, the two women were shot with 25 caliber bullets. Plastic bags were placed over both their heads, three to be exact, on each. The outermost bag was a plug for Safeway. Most others were barren of logos. A Kmart bag was pressed up against one girl's skin. That latter bag bore graphics of characters from Sesame Street. Another sick joke. A paper towel was also included in Lori's dressings. Both of the women were shot twice in the head, execution style, which had become this killer's calling card. DNA analysis was conducted on hairs that were taken from the bodies. 
The investigators struggled as false leads and faulty intel was brought in by a coterie of street people. The FBI provided some assistance with their profiling, but the description was too broad. February 8th. Yet another body was found by a pedestrian walking down a road west of Spokane County. There were three plastic bags wrapped around its head. She was killed with a single gunshot wound to the head. The body had decomposed to such an extent that even determining the gender was not something that could be distinguished by sight alone. Animals feasted on her, tearing chunks of her left arm off and eating away most of the hand. Her skin exhibited symptoms of putrefaction and decay due to having been left out in the elements for a long time. Following an autopsy, an identification was made. A woman from the missing persons list by the name of Sunny Oster. April 1st. Another body was found by two parents and their child as they walked along 14th Street. It had been dumped close to the spot where Sean McClanahan and Lori Watson were discovered. It was left in the same drainage ditch as the others. The killer had thrown leaves and grass over her in an attempt to conceal the body, but inclement weather blew the detritus aside. Three plastic bags were wrapped around the head. One gunshot was found to be the cause of death. She was identified as Linda Davies, who had been on the missing persons list. A condom was found between the cheeks of her buttocks and was entered into the lab for analysis. Michelin Durning was found. She was discovered in a vacant parking lot. She was naked. The executioner put branches and a cover from a hot tub over her. There was a single gunshot on her head from a twenty-five caliber pistol. August 1st. Christine Smith was a prostitute. This night a man pulled up in his van and asked her to service him. She asked him if he was the serial killer. He said no. He said he was an army veteran and a father of five. Christine bought it and got in the van. He asked her for oral sex, but it was a struggle for her to help him achieve an erection, a process that took her several minutes. As she did so, she suddenly felt a painful, piercing sensation in the back of her head. She was shot, though it didn't kill her. At first, she thought he hit her. He was yelling at her about how he wanted his money back because he couldn't get an erection. She managed to scramble out of the van and run away. She ran down the street all the way to a rehab center. Seeing the extent to which she had been injured, they called the medics. October. A body was found in a ditch. She was Connie LaFontaine Ellis. She was found in Tacoma. Towards the end of 1999, Robert Yates brought the corpse of Melody Murfin to his house, where he burned it in the backyard. September 15, 1999. The detectives brought in Robert Lee Yates for questioning. He was uncomfortable the entire time, sweating bullets throughout. They asked him if he had ever hired prostitutes. He said he had, though in Germany while he was in the military. He claimed to have never done it in Spokane. He was asked for alibis, but was unable to produce them. He was asked for a blood sample, but refused. 
which was his legal right as an American citizen. A blood sample that was taken from a Corvette that was driven by Robert Yates was a match for a prostitute he hired. April 17th, police arrested Robert Lee Yates shortly after he left his house for work. He was informed he was suspected of committing murder, 18 murders, that is. Reportedly, he appeared unconcerned. Due to DNA evidence and witness testimony, Robert Lee Yates was convicted, in the end, with 13 counts of first-degree murder. He was also charged with first-degree attempted murder when it came to the girl who got away, who was known as Christine. Yates and his lawyers agreed to a plea deal to avoid the death penalty in exchange for his confession. A trial was averted, and he was sentenced to 408 years in prison. There was more conviction and sentencing to come. Pierce County Police accused him of committing two more murders, those of Melinda Mercer and Connie LaFontaine Ellis. The prosecutors were able to convince the judge to sentence him to death. However, the law states that he would have to serve the 408 years before being executed. Yates remains in prison to this day. Part 2. Gert Van Royen and Joey Herhoff South Africa has the unfortunate reputation of being the country with the third highest rate of serial killers in the world, only preceded by the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Over the past century, 112 active serial killers were convicted in South Africa, which effectively means at any given time in the country's history, there has been one or more active serial killers within the borders of the country. Of all the prolific serial killers who claimed the southern tip of Africa, with its magnificent beaches, towering mountain ranges, and abundant fauna and flora, there is one, the man who brought home to citizens that monsters don't have green scales, fangs, and hide in your nightmares. The scariest monsters might be your neighbor, your fellow church member, or even your own father. During the period 1988 to 1989, the cities of Pieterberitzburg, Johannesburg, and Pretoria were in a state of continuous terror, since six young girls between the ages of nine and 16 seemed to have vanished without a trace. Police launched a frantic search, but due to the lack of information and evidence, the missing girls seemed to have disappeared like mist before the sun. On the 1st of August, 1988, Tracy Lee Scott Crosby, aged 14, from Randburg, disappeared from the Cresta Shopping Center. She was last seen entering a Volkswagen Beetle, but no other information was available. Her brother, who originally would have accompanied her, would struggle with his choice not to join her for many years afterwards, and, in a bizarre twist, he was years later convicted of beating a farm worker unconscious, and then throwing the limp man's body to the lions to feed upon. The conviction was later overturned, but Tracy's brother was just one of the unknown victims whose lives were scarred by an evil that would leave more questions than answers in its wave of terror. On the 22nd of December, 1988, 12-year-old Fiona Harvey 
from Pieter Marisberg disappeared on her way to the corner shop to buy some milk for her mother. Witnesses would recall a white truck with Van Royen building contractors written on the side of the vehicle. Police would not immediately relate the abduction to the cases in Pretoria and surrounding area, but it would later emerge that the suspects spend time not only in Gauteng, but also the coastal resorts of KwaZulu-Natal. Sadly, her body is one of these six disappeared girls whose bodies were never found and the only clue to what might have happened to Fiona was the witnessing of the pickup truck with the company logo. On the 7th of June 1989, nine-year-old Joan Horn was abducted on her way to school, never to be seen again. Once again, police had no clues to follow up. Detectives were becoming frustrated with the mounting case files which seemed to be connected, although how they were connected seemed elusive. Pretoria was the capital of the country and known as one of the friendliest cities for students. It was also during the apartheid era that the crimes occurred, and suburban middle-class white folks were not prepared for the darkness that was not meant to happen behind white picket fences. The danger seemed not to belong amongst looming jacaranda trees and manicured gardens. During July 1989, 16-year-old Janet Delport from Pierre Miritzburg would be found wandering around in a drugged daze after she was reported earlier in the day as missing. Due to the drugs in her system, or perhaps because she would have a psychological block on her memory of the time she was abducted, she would offer police no information about the abduction. Only later, Janet would realize, as the story of the six missing girls would unfold, regardless of what had happened during those missing hours, she was one of the lucky ones to escape. Nine-year-old Rosa Peel would, however, disappear a couple of weeks later. Police by now were well aware of the modus operandi of the perpetrator, and despite the fact that there was not a single piece of evidence to link Rosa's abduction to the others, detectives believed they were looking for the same man. Soon afterwards, Odette Boucher, aged 13, and Anne-Marie Wapanar, aged 11, would together be abducted on their way to school on the 22nd of September, 1989. On the 29th of September, 1989, Anne-Marie's mother would receive a letter from Anne-Marie saying that she and Odette had run away to the coast with some boys. Since the content was completely out of line with their daughter's personality, Anne-Marie's mother took the letter to the detective in charge and both agreed that the letter was written under duress. The abductor or abductors were becoming brazen. All the kidnappings took place in broad daylight and in public places such as shopping centers. Still, the teams of detectives who dedicated all their time, energy, and resources to catch a predator had practically no information, no leads, and it was as if six young girls just vanished without a single trace. Detectives were especially concerned with the escalation of the number of abductions. The time between kidnappings became less and openly taking two girls in daylight indicated to police that the culprit was very good at what he did, highly intelligent and a pure psychopath. Very little was known as far as serial murderers and predators of serial offenders, but police knew from previous international cases that the escalation in part was not a good sign. It is an unfortunate barometer, but the faster the escalation, the more likely the perpetrator would make more mistakes. Police could not understand how the abductor, who according to the psychological profile was definitely a white male, could not only get away with his crimes, but do it almost effortlessly. 
Yolanda Wessels was very familiar with the house at 227 Mallerby Street. It was the home of her aunt, Francina Johanna Harhoff, better known as Joey's Home. On the afternoon of the 22nd of December, 1989, she left her home to visit with her aunt, also never to be seen again. Detectives interviewed Harhoff, but she would later be described as a harmless, friendly old lady, eager to assist in the disappearance of her niece. Little did they know or even suspect that they were speaking to one half of the most notorious international serial killer couples in the world. Friends and family would later describe Harhoff as a gentle soul, always pleasant and soft-spoken, and that the change in her only came after she fell in love with Cornelius Garhondus von Royen, known as Gert. Many believed she was seduced by Van Royen, who seemed short, with a slight hunch, and not very attractive in comparison with the vivacious and good-looking younger woman. It is, however, difficult to consolidate this impression with the woman who repeatedly and willingly lured girls to her car, including her own flesh and blood, with a gentle-natured woman people described. Love could not possibly be that blind. It is more likely that, like her lover, Harhoff acted very well the part of a respectable housewife image she successfully portrayed to the world. The 11th of January, 1990, was a beautiful summer's day in Pretoria, capital city of South Africa. 16-year-old Joan Boyens was late for her connecting bus to her high school, which would be another quarter of an hour of waiting. Joan had hardly been standing at the bus stop at Church Square when a friendly, blonde, middle-aged woman stopped next to her and asked what school she was attending. Joan told her when the woman offered to take her to her school. Joan didn't hesitate. Joan was aware of stranger danger, but this lady could have been the mother of any of her friends. Once in the car, the conversation flowed comfortably. The woman asked if Joan would mind if they could stop at her house to let her people know she was taking Joan to school. Joan did not mind, and soon they pulled into the driveway of a neat home in one of the leafy suburbs of Pretoria. The woman entered the house, but came out minutes later and asked Joan if she would mind waiting inside, since no one was at home. Joan obliged. Once inside, she noted how tidy the house was. Most of the doors in the house were closed, but she saw school uniforms from different schools on a bed and asked the woman, whose name was Joey Harhoff, whose clothes the items were. Harhoff told Joan the uniforms belonged to her children and she was planning on donating the items. Once in the master bedroom, Joan turned around to find Harhoff had vanished, and instead the menacing figure of a man, who she later described as having devilish eyes, was grabbing her and forcing her to kiss him. Utterly shocked and repulsed, Joan fought back. The man, who would later be identified as Gert Van Royen, punched her in the face, and by the time Joan had regained her focus... She found she was staring down the barrel of a gun. As Van Royen lifted her from the bed with a headlock, Harhoff entered with a handful of pills, stockings, handcuffs, tape, and a glass of water. The magnitude of her situation and the realization that this kind woman was not going to help her hit her at once. Joan was forced to drink the tablets. She was tied up gagged, after which Van Royen proceeded to sexually assault her. She was then locked up in a closet, where she lost consciousness for a while. It is important to know that Joan was small for her age, and that Van Royen usually abducted younger victims. 
Joan immediately started loosening her bindings and managed to open the closet door. The drugs she had been forced to drink had not completely worn off, but despite being terrified, she knew she had to escape. Fortunately, Harhoff was in the backyard, completely unaware of her abductee's escape. Joan made it to the front door, always alert for any other signs of the man who had molested her, and by pure luck, found the front door open. Dazed and confused, she made her way to the street, but Harhoff noticed her escaping and ran after her. A motorist finally stopped, took in the disheveled girl. The escape of Joan Boyens would lead investigators to what the press dubbed the House of Horrors. The motorist took in the frantic girl with a pair of handcuffs still attached to her arm and told the woman that they should take the situation to her residence instead of sorting it out in the street. Joan pleaded with the motorist and would not let go of his arm. Once in his vehicle, through a river of tears, she once again begged the Samaritan to not take her back to the house. Fortunately, the kind man promised the frightened girl not to, and they immediately made their way to the nearest police station. She was still so heavily under the influence of the narcotics that she had to be carried into the police station. Once inside, her invaluable statement would have finally give the task team from across South Africa not one, but two names to the monsters who had been terrorizing the suburban streets of South Africa. The task team immediately after getting the statement headed for the home Joan identified, but their suspects, who they by now have identified as Joey Harhoff and Gert Van Royen, had clearly made a run for it. Apart from agreeing to maintain surveillance on the residents, a massive manhunt started on the 11th of January, 1990. According to Harhoff's daughter, they had returned from Clerksdorp after visiting family on the 13th of January, 1990, to find the window near the front door had been broken. Amor would later, in her book about the tremendous abuse she had suffered under her mother, Joey, explain that she and her husband proceeded to enter the house. Van Royen and Harhoff had appeared from the main bedroom, clearly half asleep, and through the ramblings, Amor could figure out that her mother and her mother's lover had kidnapped a child for ransom, and that the child had escaped. Amor had no idea how dark the truth would eventually be, and how it would cost her husband his job, and cause them not only to lose everything they had worked for, but also caused an entire community to blame and resent the couple, despite the fact that their only relation to the crime is that Amor was related to one of the suspects. Little is known about where they were in the five days that followed Joan's kidnapping. They did hide for a night in Amor's home, as well as at Harhoff's sister's house, and records would later reveal that they went to KwaZulu Natal, only to return to Pretoria a day later. Why the couple decided on the evening of the 15th of January 1990 to return to their residence at 227 Mahler B Street, no one will ever know. According to Detective Inspector Don Chandler, who became involved with the case, after Fiona Harvey was abducted, would later in a radio interview tell a captive audience what he first-hand experienced. The moment the couple noticed the presence of police, they fled in Van Royen's white pickup truck, and a short car chase ensued. Detective Chandler would testify that all police staff involved in the case were under strict instructions not to kill either of the occupants. As the white pickup truck crossed the creek that serves as unofficial border between Capitol Park and Pretoria West, both the left front and back wheels were shot out, and the vehicle came to a grinding halt. Detective Chandler would later admit that he played the events that followed over and over in his head. 
He saw as Van Bruyen pulled Harthoff's head down to the gear lever and saw as a shot was fired. Van Royen's door was locked, and before any of the police officers involved could act, he shot himself. Van Royen and Harhoff had, according to a last will and testament found at their home, decided to make a suicide pact. Neither of them would ever be held accountable for the devastation they caused, and after their deaths, families were no closer to finding their children. At 227 Mallerby Street, police started collecting forensic evidence. Odette's perfect pin and Anne Marie's school bag, as well as her address, would be found hidden under a carpet. The stationery on which the so called letter of the missing girls had written was also found. Still, despite turning the garden and house upside down in their search, no remains of the girls would be found. ABSA Bank would, in May of 1990, donate the Van Royen house to the police, and a forensic team would systematically comb through every inch of the property, but hardly any new evidence would surface. There's not much available as far as the history of the duo whose acts would leave broken families in its wake. Cornelius Garhodis Van Royen was born on the 11th of April, 1938. His first brush with the law was in 1954, during which he stole clothing, a firearm, and a vehicle. Subsequently, he was sent to a reform school. He married Aletta Van Royen, and together they had six children. The marriage was, however, rocky, and they would eventually divorce. In 1979, Van Royen abducted two young girls, aged 10 and 13, and drove them to the Harda Beast Portem, where he forced them to strip and perform sexual acts on him. South Africa would, however, only be implementing the National Register for Sex Offenders in 2007. It was, therefore, easy to hide the fact that he was a pedophile. Once he had fulfilled his sexual desires, he took them back to Pretoria. Consequently, the girls reported the crime, and Van Royen was sentenced to only four years jail time, but released early on good behavior. After his release, he successfully integrated himself back into the community and operated a building contractor business in partnership with his brothers, with some success. Joey Herhoff entered his life somewhere during this time. There is very little as far as the history of the couple is concerned. To outsiders, Herhoff and Van Royen were just an ordinary middle-aged couple, and even after suspicions at the police station were raised, the officers who went to investigate would return reporting that he met a harmless old lady and that absolutely nothing seemed untoward. After the event of the depravity was revealed, many felt that Harhoff was perhaps under the influence of Van Royen and suffered from Stockholm Syndrome, during which a hostage falls in love with their captor. But in a tell-all book by her daughter, Amor, Harhoff physically, emotionally, and psychologically abused her own children from a very small age. Amor would remember laying in her cot and having punches rain down on her. When she was older, her mother would sneak into the room and punch her in the stomach while she was sleeping for no apparent reason. Amor's father would also sexually abuse her from a very young age, and even after Amor's grandmother spoke to her off, her mother would just pretend as if it did not happen. Amor struggled for years with the trauma and emotional scars left by the abuse, but nothing would prepare her for the shocking news that her mother, who only met Van Royen at the beginning of 1988, was an accomplice in one of the worst crimes South Africa had ever known. There was enough to link the couple to the disappearance of the six children and not enough to give any indication 
of what might have happened to the victims. To the families, closure would remain elusive. Leads seemed to be single, loose threads that seemed to unravel as soon as they were tugged. The family and friends of the victims would repeatedly have their hopes shattered by false leads, and 30 years later, the mystery of the missing six girls remains a haunting, unsolved puzzle. Detective Chandler never stopped searching for the girls, and even after retiring in 1996, he continued to follow up the thousands of leads and interviewing the thousands of witnesses. According to a radio interview in 2020, the human trafficking angle is a recent avenue that investigators are pursuing. Flippy Van Royen, son of Gert Van Royen, was arrested and found guilty of kidnapping and murdering a 15-year-old foreign national. He did receive the death penalty, which his father no doubt would have gotten, but the sentence was overturned when South Africa's constitution was rewritten and the death penalty abolished. While incarcerated, he frequently made bold public statements about his father's and Harhoff's activities. He told reporters that his father kidnapped more than 40 children. Flippy said that his father would originally kidnap black children since authorities would, in pre-apartheid era, be much less likely to look for children who were not white. The human traffic angle has always been of concern, especially considering how much time Van Royen spent at the harbor. As a matter of fact, he was working for a shipping company. To hide the girls in containers and export them would have been easy in his position, but so far all local and international leads have rendered no answers. Dock workers as well as cleaning staff have, however, confirmed later to police that Van Royen asked them frequently for children. During his many interviews in 1996, Flippy Van Royen told reporters of high-ranking National Party members who were involved in clandestine meetings with his father with regards to obtaining underaged girls for sexual pleasure. Flippy has, however, discredited himself terribly, and in 2001, he was charged with lying about these allegations, and no one paid much heed to, his, to these statements until Detective Inspector Mac Minnie and reporter Chris Stain published their book, The Lost Boys of Bird Island, in which many of the same charges were made, and Van Royen's name definitely mentioned as a player in a national clandestine pedophile trafficking ring. The book was, however, retracted, and Mark Minnie committed suicide in 2019, once again, leaving more questions than answers. There was never a trial, and Gert Van Royen and Joey Harhoff were never charged with any crimes. In light of all the witness statements and evidence, they were undoubtedly the masterminds of either a human trafficking ring or they were kidnapping and disposing of children for their own sadistic reasons. The devastation the missing children caused would ripple through their families and touch every person in the country. Many of the missing six's parents would divorce and a couple hired psychics and private investigators and in doing so would grow deeper and deeper in debt. It's easy to understand the desire to be able to bury your child in order for the grieving process to begin, but after so much time, thousands of witness statements and thousands of leads only parents like the Bouchers and retired detective Don Chandler still feel that intimate connection with the case that forces them to continue searching. Recently, after flattening the ground at the house of 227 Mullerby Street, a group of artists erected a wall of remembrance with the names of all six of the girls who vanished without a trace. A wall might seem cold comfort to a grieving parent, but the wall, which was erected in 2020, is perhaps the only way loved ones could find some form of memorial to their lost children. It might not be a gravestone, but it's a tribute to six little girls who might be gone but will never be forgotten.
This episode was written by Morgan Rector and Miss Demeanor. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.